recording this computer. Okay. All right. So um, before I get started, so I've got uh, I've got homework from three people. I will release the uh, solutions to homework nine as soon as I've got sort of critical mass of people handing theirs in. Um, Today, I uh, would like to continue talking about uh, induction in chapter 29, but I want to stop right now and see if anyone has any questions, either on homework nine or on anything since the last midterm. I'll just open it up. Can we just have like a reminder as to how far back this actually goes? Uh, basically circuits. So we started circuits right after the last midterm. If you can remember that far back into prehistory, I know it's been roughly 400 years since the last midterm. March lasted 700 weeks and I don't know about April. We're only in week two, week three of the lock-in. We still have another two months to go. <clears throat> so this is all going to be fun. You have an interesting definition of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know how many how many of you are locked in with school age kids right now, but homeschooling on top of this is so it's all just pretty neat. I have two school age teachers in my house. Yeah. Okay. So they're going insane. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, yeah. I we've been I seeing mean, online Schoology and Zoom just slowly going crazy. So, uh, but I yeah, the so the content on played. the um, on the midterm is circuits, uh, magnetic circuits and magnetic fields, basically. So, um, just chapters twenty five through twenty nine, I think. But that's, but that's the extent of it. So I've got an exam, always, everyone always asks, so I might as well tell you. So I've got an exam that's got three problems and about a dozen multiple choice type questions. Um, and so the, so the thing will be, I'll give you the test. Uh, I'm gonna ask you to log into Zoom, um, just so you can ask me questions and I can sort of know that you're alive and got it. Um, so I'll ask you to log into Zoom. I'll put up the link for the, for the exam, and you can do it on a piece of paper. It'll take you two or three pieces of paper, probably, um, including the multiple choice, right? You can just write your answers to the multiple choice, A, B, C, D. And then uh, I'll, uh, and then you can snap a photo of it with your camera, the way you've been doing for your homework, and send it to me, and I'll give you like 20 minutes or whatever to upload the homework, okay? So I'll say that's like an hour and, hour and 30 minutes for the whole thing. Um, can we print off the test and do it on the test itself? Say again? Can no, we, like, no, you can write it on a piece of paper. So I'll have it, I, I've changed it so you don't have to write on the on the things. You can just write number one A, number two B, and then do the problems. Like I said, it should take two or three sheets of paper. Um, I did this with my upper year class the other day and it took a surprising amount of time for people to sort of get it scanned and hand it in. So I'm not going to be a, like a massive stickler if you're, if you're one minute over the line or something. I just want to set a timeline so that people don't take two days to finish the exam. So, okay. Uh, and you're allowed to be using um, your notes in the textbook. You are not allowed to be looking things up online or talking to other people. And you're on, it's an honor system. I can't, I can't seriously enforce that, but I'm just going to ask that everybody do that. It's, and you know what the tests are like, right? It, unless you have somebody taking the test for you, resources aren't going to be a massive help. They can be a little bit of help, but they won't be a massive help. Do not, do not uh, mistake. And some, if you haven't ever taken an open book exam before, I will warn you, an open book exam is usually not easier. Having the resources next to you is not useful unless you know exactly where to look in the resources. And frequently you'll be asked questions where the resources can't help you because you have to synthesize. You have to, uh, instead of regurgitate. So if you're taking exams that are basically open book, um, if you haven't had any already, reminder that you still need to study for those. Um, having them be open book is not as good. If you're having take home exams where the exam, like, you, and I've done this with upper year classes where you give an exam and you get the exam back in three days. Um, those are also 
very intensive. And studying for those is less important, but there's gonna be a lot of time to do the one of those exams. I'm not gonna give you one of those because the questions I'd have to give you would be so hard that it would kill you. And I've got no interest in killing anybody uh, in this season. It's already bad enough, so. Uh, any questions, comments, thoughts on material so far? Um, if we are, have been using like an online textbook, like we're still allowed to have that pulled up, correct? I'm because sorry, I can't like, hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? I right, try again. Okay. Um, if we have an online textbook, like we've been using one, like on like that's downloaded on our computer, we can still yeah. have that pulled up. Yeah, right? that, that's fine. I, like I said, I can't actually enforce it. So if you're looking at a screen, I'm just going to assume that you're looking at the textbook. Okay. That's, that, yeah, I can't actually, you guys are on your honor system. You know what you're doing. You know, yes, someone somewhere in the school is going to cheat on one of these things and we can't stop it. We're just going to assume that most people try to do their best and that's all we can do. So um, everybody knows, I think, I mean, and it's one thing that may not be obvious to you guys is everybody knows that next year, every single student in America and probably in the world is going to come into, is going to come start in the fall underprepared relative to every, to where they would have been otherwise. Like everybody is going to have done less work this year. So we're just going to be ready for that next year. So um, we're not covering quite as much material. We're just going to be ready for that. Um, it sucks but that's all we can do. Okay, well, if anybody has any questions or thinks of anything, just feel free to interrupt, you know, just uh, shout out and you can ask questions along the way if we, if we can change topics. This is kind of a weird time, so I'm not gonna be a real stickler on class discipline or anything stupid like that. Um, but I would like to press on a little bit with the magnetic stuff because we've got, because there's a lot of interesting stuff to do. And this stuff is quite important, I think, um, if you're, especially if you're discussing engineering or you're discussing uh, other sciences. This is where really electricity and magnetism is where physics is really important in other places. So last time we discussed the case, if I have an electron moving this way in an electric field, it feels a force, right? Okay, so V cross B into the page. Can you the share your screen? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that, 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 that. I thought I was sharing it. Sorry. I'm sorry. That's a good question. What the hell are you talking about, Dr. Tag? That's a, that's excellent. Oh, now I can't see you guys. Mm. Oh, no. let's, let's try that again. Share screen. Okay, there, now I can see you guys. All right. Um, all right, so let's say we have an electron. It's headed to the right. There's a, a magnetic field that's into the page, right? So F equals Q, B cross B. So V is to the right, that's the velocity. B is into the page. So F would be up, it was a positively charged particle, so the force is down, it was a negatively charged particle. But similarly, if I put a bar of metal into this field and I pull it to the right, it's got electrons in it. And so those electrons will start accumulating down at the bottom and I'll lift the positive charges at the top. And so if I put this on a voltmeter, I'll be able to see the voltmeter register a voltage. And this is the basic idea behind a generator. And so this is what we were talking about last time. So there's going to be the uh, voltage that you see here, the EMF, which we represent with that curly E, that's going to be for obviously proportional to the velocity. And it's obviously going to be proportional to how big the magnetic field is, right? The bigger field or a, or a bigger or a faster move is clearly going to generate more, um, more uh, force here. Or if I'm connecting this in a circuit, I'm just measuring the current, the current is going to be also go up with these things. So that's, um, so that's fairly straightforward, right? Now, I'll show you the app I tried to get everybody to use. Apparently, nobody was able to use it. I don't know why I was able to use it okay. Um, so let's uh, stop share, share screen, this thing. So this is the toy 
uh, this little Java applet I linked to in the warm-ups. So what I've got here is I've got a loop of wire uh, with, a, with a light bulb on top, or I can make that a, a voltmeter if I like. And this is all, this is not a realistic scale numbers, but this is schematically all correct, right? So if I, I'll just show you this first. Here's just a bar magnet, and you can see the magnetic field around the bar magnet when I move the bar magnet around, and you can see all the little compasses. And if they're grayed out, it means a weak magnetic field, and if they're very bright, it means a strong magnetic field. And I can also I can bring this guy around, make him move around. So, um, uh, oh, and we, and so here's another example of like here is. The, the example we've been discussing the last couple of days, which is current running through a coil. And this is a solenoid. And so this creates a magnetic field that looks a lot like the magnetic field of the bar magnet. The both of those are the same. Now, for uh, this guy, what we've been saying is this is our bit of wire right here. So our bit of wire is running, um, uh, is running in and out of the page. And we have a magnetic field that's to the right here from the magnet. So if I move this coil up and down, now you can see that the light bulb glows very dimly when I do this. If I bring it closer to the magnet, it glows a little brighter. So as I move it, you can see the light bulb shines, right? And this is the basic example. So now I've got the motion. For instance, if I drag this guy downwards, the velocity is down towards the bottom of the screen. The magnetic field is right, is to the right. So V cross B would mean a force towards us. And those are electrons in the wire, so they're going to move away from us. So if I drag this guy down, yes, indeed, the electrons move slightly away from us if you look at the little blue dots. But now, this is all fine. And, this can, and we, we could continue with this, and we could explain everything that's happening. But there's a problem, which is with that explanation. And that's, the problem is this. If I move the magnet, I also get the light to light up. Now this is a problem, and we can't explain it using the physics we've already got because there's no velocity to these electrons. Those electrons have got zero velocity, and they're in a magnetic field. But we know that they have zero velocity. Then they have. Uh, let me see. Get the share screen. Do the. Oops. Share screen. I keep getting the wrong window here. I've got too many windows open. Right? Is if is if there's no velocity, then there should be no force on those electrons, even if there's a strong magnetic field. So this new phenomenon, where moving the magnet uh, changes, it creates um, motion of the electrons. That is a new rule. That is brand new physics that we haven't seen before. So we need a way of describing this. We need a new rule for this case. Now, it turns out that the underlying rule we're going to get to, and just like we did before, is first we want to see what works on wires, and then we'll see what works on nuclear charges. But first we see there's force on wires, so that means there's force on charges. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to just come up with a rule that works for loops of wire. And we'll use that and apply that uh, to understanding what's going on. And then the, so the material we're going to get to next, which I'm not going to go into huge detail, is what's really happening behind the scenes. So this is the new rule that we're going to use to determine uh, whether or not you can make current flow or you can make, um, make a voltage. And that is called Faraday's law. And that is a changing magnetic flux. in a loop induces a current. Okay, go straight. No, it's not. Okay, so that's the rule. Now we have to understand what the hell it says. So this turns out is one of the ways of stating a fundamental rule of physics. There's many ways of stating it. This one is the most practical way of stating it. And so what this is saying is, when I'm looking up here, what I shouldn't be looking at is I shouldn't be looking at this bar. Instead, what I should be looking at is this shaded area here, that this is my loop. And I'm going to ask what the magnetic flux is in that loop. OK, so let's. So let's start from scratch, right? So 
flux, right? We had this in electric fields, right? A flux in electric field, this is what we we're doing when we we're doing Gauss's law. And we said the electric flux is equal to the electric field times the area, right? So this was, if I had some area and I had some field punching through it, I add, multiply those two together and I'd see how perpendicular they were, right? And so this was what was telling us where the smoke was fire, which is another, and another, and of course, so if I'm talking about the magnetic flux, then that's B dot A, which is again, or, or if we want to get all mathy about it, we could say B dot D A if we're integrating over a whole surface. But the other explanation for this, remember, so, so you remember what we were dealing with, with uh, Gauss's law when we were talking about flux. What was, the, what was sort of the, the way we talk about it in terms of diagrams? What was the other, what, what, was, uh, what was flux counting? Does anybody remember? Lines in and lines out. That's right, lines in and lines out. So what this is counting then is the number of lines that go through my area. But the area I'm going to work with here is if I have my loop, if I have a loop of wire, it's going to be how many lines of, the, of magnetic field punch through the surface of that loop. So if I have a loop of wire, like my, like my little coil, right, it would be the surface of that, that but it would be what I would get if I put a piece of tape over that, the surface of the piece of tape that I would put over the surface of that loop. So what Faraday's law says is that if not, if I have a magnetic field in, that punches through my loop, but if the but if the number of field lines that punch through my loop changes, then I get a current induced, or then I get an EMF induced. So let's just a uh, quick reminder. Oh, I have to pull out here. Do I have a digital zoom being applied right now? I don't think so. Maybe I want to be sideways. That's the problem. I want to be sideways, and then I was taking pictures. That's why. Okay, there we go. That's better. All right, somebody's answering C. That seems to be the majority. Discuss why. So first you're doubling the um, number. So there's gonna be instead of a five by five, it'll be, uh, instead of 25, it'll be 50 in there. Um, but then you're gonna cut all the sides in half. So then you'll be going, Wait, no, I just think I logic myself out of that. So what do you think the answer is? I think it's gonna be, um, it's, I think it's one of the down by options. I think it's down by two maybe. Yeah, so, so the area quarters, if I have both sides, the area quarters and the field doubles. So yeah, it's gonna be down by a factor of two, right? Making you say it out loud is the thing that, that fixes it, right? This is one of the problems with doing this, with doing with this format. I wanna keep doing these questions because it forces everybody to think about it, but the problem is unless you talk it out with somebody else, it's really hard to see you know, what mistake you're making. The, the act of saying it out loud forces you to consider it. It's why we do this technique, and this is a terrible format for this technique. Okay, 
but yeah, it's going to be going to be A. So what formula could I use for the maximum possible flux? In terms of B and A. Would that be sine of 90? Well, so, so if, I, so if it, I get the maximum flux when the B is pointing which way? Oh, when it's pointing up. When it's pointing straight up, right? So. In that case, theta is zero, right? Because remember, we measure the angle relative to the normal coming out of the plane. Right? So it's this angle. So there we'd want theta equal to zero, right? And so if you remember the dot product formula is, the, is B dot A is equal to B A cosine theta, right? So if the two are aligned, theta is zero, and then this just becomes B A. Right, so that's the best is when it's pointing straight up. Okay, so now I want cosine theta to be what? One half. One half, right? So what value of theta gets me one half? Not 45 degrees. Cosine 45 is one over root two. It's one over root two, not one over two. Is it 30? No. It's 60. It's 60. it's 60. I know I'm making you guys remember the unit circle. Just to, just to prove you that we don't remember anything from anywhere. Yeah, so it's cosine 60 is one half. Oh, what an evil question. Okay, so if you have a flux going through your loop and the flux is changing, that makes the current flow. So if we go back to our original picture, what we're doing by pulling this rod to the right is we're reducing how many field lines punch through my loop. As I move my rod from here to here, there are fewer magnetic field lines in my loop. And so the magnetic, so the total flux is dropping and that's a change. And so that gives me an EMF, that gives me a, a current flowing or a voltage here, depending on whether this is a voltmeter or an ammeter. So, so what we're doing is we're changing the loop. The, the magnetic field isn't changing, but the, mag the, the total flux inside the loop is changing. All right, what would happen if I did this? Some disagreement. I go one, two, three, vote. Okay, one, two, three, vote. I'm gonna start doing that from now on because you guys are starting to mode lock. Okay, some B's and some A's. Okay, Lauren, why do you say no? That means I'm wrong. No. It means you're in the minority. I'm usually choosing the minority to talk about it. I really don't, like, just, like, intuitively. Um, I know that in the other examples, there was always some kind of thing supplying a voltage difference. And in this example, there isn't. It's just metal moving through a magnetic field. Mm -hmm. But then again, like the magnetic field should, like could do something to the electrons in the loop of wire that could change it. So I'm really, 
Okay, like, so, you're, so you're basically you're basically just feeling like it should nothing should happen. Okay, somebody else, somebody else who answered B. I forgot who it was. Um. Yeah. I thought it was because at an instant when you move to the side, the same amount of fields in it. Yeah. So that's so that's correct. I'm going to have the same flux in there. So is there a changing flux? There should no. be no. There shouldn't be a changing flux, right? So somebody answered A. Why did you answer A? I forgot who it was now. It was like initially when we were talking about it, it was just we talked about it as movement before we talked about it as flux. So like if movement was happening, then I thought then. Right. So there is movement happening, but now we have to think about what that movement is doing. So it, let's think about it as though. So let's make this a little bit easier. Let's let's say my loop looked like this. And I've got this in the magnetic field. Can't see it. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, am I not sharing the screen? Oh, I see. Well, I'll try that again. I move my windows around. It doesn't like when I do that. Okay, you see it now? Yeah. Okay. So let's say I have this kind of loop, and I'm going to pull it this way. Well, so uh, what Caleb said is exactly correct, is that that version of it is still the same. I'm always going to have the same number of x's in, no matter where I am. But let's think about it in terms of the, in terms of the rod we were thinking about before. So these electrons, and this wires are going this way. And so they will feel the field of V cross B uh, uh, up. So they'll feel a force down, right? And these electrons will also feel a force down. So if I look at that, there's a push on electrons going this way and a push on electrons going this way. So there's neither a push clockwise nor counterclockwise, right? There's no net push. These electrons will feel a force down just as much as these electrons feel a force down. So I might get a little negative charge accumulating on the bottom here and a little positive charge accumulating on the top, but that won't drive a current around. It won't drive a voltage that makes, that makes the current flow. Or to put it another way, if I break off, right, if I break off my wires here, or let's say I break off my wires here and put a voltmeter across it, I won't, I won't see a voltage. Uh, here I would see a voltage because this is now outside the, outside the field. So I have to be, you have to be careful about that sort of thing. So in this one, no current's going to flow. So the so the bees actually have it here, and Lauren's uh, intuition, as you know, muddled as it is, is actually correct. That you that you're not going to get that you're not going to get any current here. And Caleb's and Caleb's definitional version is also correct. The that, the, the, the the size of the magnetic field isn't changing. B isn't changing. And uh, the area isn't changing, and the angle between the area and B isn't changing, so the flux isn't changing, or the number of magnetic field lines isn't changing. So there's no changing, even though it's moving. There's no changing, and so there's no there's no there's no EMF that's created, so no current flows in that case. So would it not matter what direction you moved it? It still would never have a change if the B is constant. Like if the Correct. flux never changed, it doesn't matter what direction. Yeah, it wouldn't matter what direction, in that case. Ah, but let me give you a couple of questions where it might. I think everyone's answering A, which is correct, right? Now the number of field lines is increasing as it moves to the right. So here I will get a current going. Right, again, I'm getting a change. Now what if I didn't pull this guy down. What if I pull this, just pull this guy and his velocity was straight to the right, would I get a change? Would I get a current? No, right? Because, because here, so the direction in this case does matter, right? Right, Nick? So here, the total flux wouldn't be changing, and so I wouldn't get a current in that because nothing is moving. And you can think about this in terms of our original picture again if you want. But I want to start moving away from that picture and into the Faraday's Law picture. Okay. 
There's one other way I can move my loop. There are two other ways I can move my loop. So how about this? I'm going to take my loop and I'm going to spin it. Let's see if I have to join these wires together. Right, nothing's gonna happen there, right? Because I've still got the same amount of flux that's going through it. Do I see any bees? Is everybody in total agreement here? Complete mind meld? Yes, well, you're correct, right? So what's changing in the formula now? The B isn't changing and the A isn't changing. What's changing? Angle between them. The, the angle between them, right? If, if the loop is pointing straight out, then the normal for that loop is the, the A vector is pointing straight out of the page or straight into the page, depending on what sign convention you use. And the B field is also pointing straight in or straight out of the page, right? But now if I turn it sideways, now there's an angle between this and this. And so depending on which, which angle I have, so it can be 180 degrees or zero degrees or 90 degrees. And so as it turns, that angle is changing and you get, and you get a flux induced. And this is the basic way in which we use generators. This is the easiest way for a generator to work is to uh, is to have a is to have a spinning loop, and of course we'd use more than one loop, but but one loop is enough to get the idea across. So wait, so is it reading ninety nine? As it's uh, like before it enters, it's just, it's just a just a placeholder. I'm not really 99. It was just a just a number. Some people change their minds. I hope this isn't peer pressure. All right. Oh, Lauren's going for C. Okay, Lauren is what I'm picking on her. So Nathan, what do you think? What's why do you say C or D? Um, I said D because. I didn't. I thought it would be small while it's outside of a field, and then bigger once it's in the field. And then it, I thought the field wasn't infinite, so it would exit the field again. It would exit the field and again. Get okay, small. So, so, so let's say this field keeps going on to the right. What would we expect to happen? Yeah. So, so I, um, there's all when it first enters. There's like a, only like a few. Uh, field lines going through it, then as like it gets more into it, more field lines start entering it. So that's why I say like it gets bigger and then like it starts to get smaller when all of them are are in the, when it's Right, entirely. because it's not how many field lines it's, that's in it, it's how many, the, how the field lines are changing. So at first, when it's outside, well, now there's no change, so there's no voltage, right? When, I, when, the left, when the right side hits, now I'm starting to get Xs inside my field. So now, the, so now the field is increasing, the flux is increasing, or the flux is increasing, and so, so, the, so there's a change, so I start reading a voltage, right? And, it, and so the, the voltage becomes bigger, and then eventually, it's gonna change only a little bit. As I, so when it first enters, right, I'm only letting in a few Xs. This is a really bad example because this loop is so tiny. I would have, I would have originally answered D for the same reasons that Nathan did, 
And then I saw that the voltmeter's not actually connected, so then I said none of the above. <laughs> oh, that's just a that's just a graphic error. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. Let me. I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to be a trick question. I'll, at least not here. I will play trick questions, but usually it'll have something to do with what we're talking about, not just the. This, it was it was built by a student. A student tried to set up the experiment, and they made it. But anyway, so here the flux is changing. Uh, the, there aren't many x's entering per second, but when I have the it's halfway over, now I've got a lot of x's entering per second. Right, the change is actually quite rapid here because it's so wide. I'm getting a lot of changes for every inch I move this thing. I get a lot more x's. Then when I get to the right hand side, now I'm only getting a few fewer x's every every bit I move it. And then when I'm in here, it's like the first question I asked you is now the flux isn't changing at all. So it'll go small and then high and then small again. So, so, that's, so that's, the, that's the correct answer there. So now what we can do is now let's attempt to figure out how much it changes, right? And to do this, we can actually go back to our first model, the one we understand, and have a magnetic field, and let's have a, a bar of metal. And I'll put this bar on rails like this. And the idea here is, is that I slide the bar along. It's still making electrical contact with these rails behind it. So these are like railroad, uh, this is like a railroad um, rails here. And I'm sliding this piece of metal left and right through this magnetic field. Right. So let's say I'm going to slide it, um, and I'll slide it to the right. And then what I'll do is I'll connect these guys to a voltmeter. And this guy's, uh, and I can have the field in here anywhere I wanted, but it doesn't really matter. Right. So as I slide this guy to the right, there's a force on the electrons, and the force on the electrons is down. So V cross into the phage, but it's an electron, so they're getting pushed down. Now what's going to happen as I slide this guy along is at some point. I'm going to, so these electrons get forced to the bottom. And so I'll build up a positive charge up here and a negative charge down here. And what's going to happen is, is that as the electrons start accumulating down here, and notice I've got it attached to a voltmeter, so no current flows. Uh, no current, the voltmeter has infinite, it has infinite resistance. And so it's just measuring the difference in charge between the top and the bottom, or really, the, you know, really the potential, but that doesn't matter. So what's going to happen is, is I'm going to build up these negative charges in the bottom rail. And so eventually, an electron won't feel a net force anymore. It's feeling a force down because of the QV cross V. But it's also feeling a force up because it's now sitting in an electric field, right? created by these charges. So that's as I move, as I slide the bar across at constant speed, it's going to very quickly reach equilibrium. So I'm going to have an excess of electrons and an excess. I'm not going to keep building up an excess of electrons because these guys sitting here are keeping any more from moving. If I completed the loop, then they'd move and I keep pumping them through. But this is, but in this, I'm going to reach an equilibrium. So it, I mean, they're going to, electrons are going to keep moving until I've reached that equilibrium. So at equilibrium, the force on any electrons that are left in there is going to be equal to the magnetic force because now they can't have a net push anymore because if there was a net push, I'd be building up more. So that means that the electric force, Q times E, is equal to QVB. And I, here I can leave off the sine theta because everything's at right angles to everything else. And hey, this is the same thing we had as the velocity selector, right? So v times b is equal to e. Okay, well that's that's nice. So I can also ask myself about um, what the what the voltage is. So I basically have a system where I've got two plates, right, with a charge on them. And if I know the, I have two plates, so this is the top of my bar and that's the bottom of my bar. And I know that in this situation, what I'm gonna have is I'm gonna have an electric field that points this way, right? That's gonna be my electric field. So I know in this case, the electric field 
times the distance is equal to delta V, or delta V is equal to V over D, right? Because that was the definition that we had. This is the, what we got, right? Because remember, um, this is uh, what we have for parallel plates. There were a constant field here, and so if you have a constant field times a voltage, that tells us what the, uh, what the separation is here. So, now we can um, use this, right? So now I know, so I have a voltage here. And so I can use that in my previous equation. So now I know that um, V, little v, which is the velocity times V is equal to delta V times D. Okay. So now I want to work out the area. So let's go back to this original thing. This distance here, I've now called D. And let's say this distance here, I'm going to call X. Right. So the area inside my loop, that area is going to have x times d. Okay, so now how is that area changing? Well, if I change, so area equals x times d. If I change that area, the change in area is going to be equal to delta x times d, right? So if I move my rod from here to here, and I move it delta x, then that extra area is going to be delta x times d. Okay. So now I've got something I can work with here, but I also know that the speed I'm moving at is going to be delta x over delta t is going to be the velocity. Okay, so now I can use this. So let's go back and put this guy up into here. So velocity is delta x over delta t times v equals delta voltage times d. But this delta x then is related to this thing. So delta x is equal to delta A over D, delta A over delta T times B equals delta V D. Okay, so we make anything out of this. I made a mistake? I probably made a mistake. Delta x. No, that's right. So I have delta A over delta T times B equals delta V times, no, no, I shouldn't have, my D should cancel. What have I done wrong here? Do I make a mistake of backup way back here? How did you get V equals E over D? If you yeah, had V that's, equals yeah, E that's D. The, that's the stupid thing, right? Um, right? So this comes, so this comes from, so that means E is equal to delta V over D. That's the, that's correct. That was my stupidity. So let's walk through this again. So we have DB equals E, E is equal to delta V over D. Velocity is delta x over delta t times b, and delta x is equal to delta a, delta a over d over delta t, b equals delta v over d. There we go. Okay, so now we got it. So now delta a over delta t, 1 over d times b is equal to delta v. 1 over D. So the 1 over D is cancel, and I'm left with delta A over delta T, B equals delta V. Well, this over here, this is how much my flux is changing, right? Because my, my flux isn't changing because the beef is changing. It's changing because the, um, uh, it's A times B. So this is like delta AB over delta T equals delta V, but that's just the change in flux.
Or if I make this instantaneous and I change all those deltas to little d's, delta flux, delta t, and I'll put some absolute signs on this just because we've only been looking at the size of things. In fact, what we normally do when we, when we quote this, and this is the same thing as the EMF. So the EMF, we usually actually quote this as negative d psi d dt because there's some sign conventions that we're gonna talk about so the, the negative sign, the negative sign implies which way the voltage is, but it requires some definition for what this thing is. We'll come back to that, but that's, that's not important. So this is a way of stating Faraday's law. Sorry for the confusion. The textbook does it right, so when in doubt, you know, always refer to the textbook. That you have to take the time derivative, and this is what changing means, right? A changing flux creates a voltage. And if you have a voltage, that can create a current. If you have a resistive wire, so you can create a current if you have a voltage. So this is, now this only works in the special case of the rod getting moved left and right, but that's okay because we know that the same rule should apply no matter how it works. We can do this experimentally and test it, and we find that this thing is indeed correct. So I've proven this using a special case, but it's still the case that this is a new physical law because it also holds when we change a loop or when we change a magnetic field or something like that. So this is actually pretty, um, this is actually pretty new. And Dr. Tag. Yeah. Sorry about that. Our uh, power just went out for brief seconds. Oh well. <laughs> yeah, it happens sometimes. Hopefully, it doesn't happen a lot. Okay, so we've now considered how much the how much electricity I get if I if I change this loop, if I change the magnetic field in this loop. And I can change the magnetic field loop by changing the amount of, by changing the, the quantity of field I have, or by changing the angle, or by changing the size of the loop, or changing where, whether the loop sits inside the magnetic field or not. Any of those things create a deflux dt, and a deflux dt creates a voltage. Okay, so now the question is, and this is actually one of the tricky ones, is which way. Which way will the current flow? So for instance, let's say I've got a loop and let's say I've got, um, actually let's draw it like this. So let's have a loop and let's say that it's sitting in a magnetic field and the magnetic field is increasing. All right, so I go, so this is the before picture and this is the after picture, right? And there's some, and that happens over some time, right? So, so B2 is bigger than B1, right? So the question is, which way does I, do I get a current or which way do I get um, a, uh, a voltage, right? Which, if I put a voltmeter in, in that loop, well, I see the top of the loop be at high voltage, the bottom of the loop be at high voltage. Or equivalently, which way around? Would I expect the current to be running around this way or would I expect the current to be running around that way? Which way around the little one, clockwise or counterclockwise? Right, so I'm gonna take the same picture and let me draw it from the top. So if I draw it from the top, the before picture looks like this and the after picture looks like this, right? So I, so I have a B, Increasing. All right, so now I'm going to teach you the rule, and this rule is called Lenz's Law. And what, what Lenz's Law is, is that the direction of the current is such that the field made by the current opposes the change. Oh my God, what a mouthful. All right. Deuced current is such that it creates a magnetic field that 
opposes the change in flux. What? What craziness is this? So I asked, I asked you a qu basically this question on the warm up. It was, it was a variation of this. And I basically got 50 50 clockwise counterclockwise. So it's, so it's clear that at least half of you are having trouble with this, with this rule reading it from the textbook. This is a tricky one. Okay. So what this is saying is this We went from not very much field to a lot of field. And the loop wants to make it so that the, so the magnetic field isn't changing, it resists this change. So because there's now more field, it attempts to cancel this, and I'm just making up words here, this is not like there's no actual intention or anything like that. But it tends to cancel the field by creating a magnetic field that opposes the change. And so it tries to make a magnetic field that's into the, that's into the page. So this induces a field into the page to cancel this field out of the page, right? So we've got bigger coming out, so it's trying to make a field in to cancel this. So which way do you need to run a current to create a field into the page? Well, use the, use the simple right-hand rule, thumb into the page. That means the current is going this way. So this will create a current going clockwise in this, in this case. Similarly, if I go from to this, right, to the opposite case, right, the previous case on there, so you can see it, right? So in this case, the field is getting reduced. So now what the, what the current tries to do is it tries to create a field out of the page. So it tries to, it tries to buff this up. And so it creates a field. So in this case, it'll create a field out of the page. So this will be a clockwise current. So as we're reducing the magnetic field, we induce a field that's in the clockwise. Basically, nature is perverse. It always wants to keep you from doing whatever it is you're doing. And there's reasons for this that we're going to find that in terms of energy, and so on, this, this makes energy conservation work out and some other things. But that's the rule. So, so this is the takeaway for this section. The Lenz's law, which is, which is that the direction in which you get the current flowing is such that it resists the change in flux. And this is how much you get. What is that? That's a terrible D there. That the so how did we determine the sign for any of those though? Yeah, so, so this is what I'm saying is, is that this sign in here is basically telling you this rule. So this is what that sign means. But which case did we have like a positive or negative sign? So because these problems are three-dimensional, I mean, yes, I can, I can define for you that sign convention, right? The sign convention is, is that, the, is that the, this gives a current that's in the direction of the regular right-hand rule, right? So if you have a change that's up, that means that you have, a, you have an, an EMF that creates a negative version of that. This, though, it's fighting is the easiest way to talk about it, is if the field's increasing, it tries to stop that by making a field in the opposite direction. And that's the current that creates that field in the opposite direction. So where your finger is, you have the currents are in the same direction on those two circles, that red and the lower blue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the fields are the opposite. Yeah, so this is just an ex so yeah, let me let me walk through this again. The field, the magnetic field starts out small and it's getting bigger. As it gets bigger, the field, the coil doesn't like this and fights it. And so, it, so there's a field that's coming out of the page. And so it tries to create a field into the page to cancel that off. To create a field going into the page, I need to have a clockwise current. So the clockwise current is the current that happens. Does that make more sense when I say it that way? Yeah. Okay. 
This is a comp, this is the pinnacle of all the right hand rules. This is as complicated as it gets. And this is usually where I have people staring at me blankly for about five minutes until it starts to click with them. So if you're a little confused now, that's fine. That's where you should be. This is the most complicated rule we've got. But basically, the rule is the current fights the change. The current tries to keep the B field going the same way that it was before. So can you explain the, then in the second example where it, it decreases? So here, the B field is big here and it's getting smaller here. The loop doesn't like that, and so it tries to create more field to cancel out that change. It wants the field to stay big. Now, it, can't, it doesn't actually manage to do this, but that's what it's trying to do. So in order to create a field, more field out of the page, it creates a current to the right. Or if you want to use the other right hand rule, the current is going along the outside of the loop, and so it's creating a, it's creating a field up through the loop. So you need to use this rule, or you can use this rule to get that. This is this one's easier at this point, so I'm just using that. You with me? All right. So, for example, what if I had and it's becoming smaller? Which way would I see the current? Flow. Would it be A clockwise or B counterclockwise? <laughs> Stephen, that's funny. Absolutely no confusion which answer you mean. Okay. I I can't see the answers. Oh, if you if if you want to see everybody else, there's a button in the top right hand corner called No, Gap I mean Remote. I can't see what what the choices are. Clockwise. Oh, I thought I was looking at the paper to the right. Oh. Yeah, that's the one I was going to go to. I want to make sure everybody's got the base idea before I move on to more complicated examples. All right. So, yeah, this is going to be clockwise. It wants there to be more field into the page. More field into the page is, is a current that's clockwise. So it wants to create more X's. To create more X's, you make it go to the you make it go clockwise. Um, now I could have this work another way. I could have, for instance, the same rule would apply. So let's say I had a magnetic field. So I'll draw the before and after picture, so the field is the same. And here I'll have a loop like this. And let's say we we shrink the loop. All right. So what's happened to the flux here? It's gotten bigger which way? It's, it's, it's gotten, so the flux is into the page, right? Is it a bigger or smaller flux into the page? It would be the smaller picture, I think. Right, so, so this, is, this is less flux. There are fewer X's inside this circle than inside this circle. Right, okay, there's the same number of X's because I just drew not enough of them that I could draw it some more. Right, there's more X's in this circle than this circle. So if I were to do this, this circle would have an induced current. Which way? Again, clockwise or counterclockwise? Yeah, it's the same thing as above. 
it wants it it has fewer x's it wants more x's and so it tries to make more x's and it makes more x's with a clockwise turn that's lenz's law not straightforward right this is a little head bendy it's a little hard to get your head around this particular rule um nobody gets this the first time they see it this one is tricksy so uh and in particular having seen some of the answers in the warm-ups which i won't bother to go through um uh basically everyone got the second there was 50 50 on the second one or the third one and 100 percent on the second one um is you should probably go back and reread this chapter. Now, obviously we have the midterm on Monday, so that isn't gonna happen right away, but just sort of make a mental note, that you're gonna to want to re-review this stuff when we come back to it on Wednesday next week. Okay, all right. I think that's enough confusion for the day. Um, I wanted to get through this now because like most of these rules, the more often we do them, the easier it gets, right? The more practice I give you, the better you get at this. So I wanted to do it before the exam as well as after the exam so you see it more times. Um, that's always the case with any skill that you're practicing and thinking about these fields is a real skill. And if you think back to what we were doing early, early on with the electric fields, right? And we just had charges with made electric fields, right? That was super easy in comparison to what we're doing now, right? That's, this, is, um, this is far more complicated. Okay, I will end there, uh, but I'll ask again, does anyone have any questions about material they'd like to review or any questions on the homework? Um, yeah, so like in this homework nine, the first question, it was determine the direction by Bios of Art Law and not just the right hand rule. So for this, and oh, there's like the circle thing. Yeah, uh, you know, I don't care that much. Explaining that would be difficult. Yeah. The Bios of Art Law is the right hand rule. So that's a little <laughs> disingenuous. But the idea is, I mean, if I wanna know what the B feels, so let's just consider this part of the loop, right? Here would be uh, a, 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 a current element would be this little thing right here, right? If I want to know what the field is right here, this is my R vector. So the Beals of Art Law says dB, the contribution from this guy is gonna be equal to whatever that stuff was, I R hat cross DL over R squared. So this tells me the direction of the B field. So DL is this way, R hat is this way. So this thing creates a magnetic field which is out of the page. Okay, that's what I was thinking, but like, isn't that the right hand rule? Which yeah, is it's a right hand rule. So, so I just meant, so I, I think the question, I didn't write that question. I'd forgotten that line was in there. So instead of just putting your fingers on it and curling them around, like walk through the cross product rule as opposed to just um, the wrappy hand rule. That was, that was what was intended by that. Yeah, the cross product is still a right hand rule because by the definition of the cross product. The idea there was just to, to justify to yourself that all of these elements all create a magnetic field in the same direction, to, to do that again in your head, to go through that exercise. I'll sit here for another minute to see if anybody has anything else they wanna talk about. Okay, please get your homework in as soon as possible so I can put the solutions up for everyone else this weekend. Um, so if you can get that, the sooner you get that in, the sooner I can distribute the solutions. Um, so, or if you're not gonna hand something in, let me know that too. Um, uh, Monday, we'll try the exam. Um, we'll see how it goes. It'll be practice for the final in any case. Um, Everybody hang in there. Is finals week like the still the same week? Yes, we haven't moved finals week. That's correct. So we've only got like uh, nine more meeting days. No, eight more meeting days. Uh, so to take the exam off, it's seven more meeting days. So, and 
Uh, no, there's there's that last day on the Monday, but I never try to introduce new material on finals week because that's like nuts. Nobody can absorb anything by that time. So yeah, we've only got a few weeks left. We're closing in on it. So we, do, we just have to hang in there for like another three weeks and we'll be all done with this. And then we can go to summer. Okay. I haven't heard anybody talk to me about pass fail options or anything like that. If you do want to talk about that, you know, shoot me a line. Um, uh, if uh, you've got any problems, shoot me a line. I'll try to keep, I'll try to keep um, uh, Slack open and I'll keep my email open. Hang in there. Have a good weekend. <laughs>